Stones are in top form, and the tour got off to a tremendous start with the near riot which broke out in the usually serene surroundings of the Albert Hall. Literally within seconds of the boys shooting up the aisle from backstage, a solid mass of female humanity erupted onto the platform. Teenage girls came over the top in one gigantic tidal wave, and the Stones had been on stage exactly three minutes. It took long minutes of pleading from compare Long John Baldry and quite a lot of strong arm treatment from the understaffed band of bounces before sanity was regained. Then, as the lights dimmed a second time, the boys returned shooting apprehensive glances at the restless audience as they set up their gear. And from the introductory bars of satisfaction, it was all systems go. Mick was marvelous. What a showman. He knows exactly what to do at exactly the right moment. The audience was eating out of his hand. Jagger gave them everything in the book, the beckoning and pointing fingers, that intricate and fancy footwork, the lot. The fans loved every moment. The stones stick roughly to the same song routing for each show, using numbers that generate excitement. Things like Paint It Black, Under My Thumb, Get Off Of My Cloud and their new single, Have You Seen Your Mother Baby, Standing In The Shadow. And, of course, Satisfaction. Showpiece of the act is undoubtedly Lady Jane, something British audiences haven't seen before. Mick does it beautifully with immaculate gestures and deportment and very fitting madrigal dance-type footwork, ending with a long low sweeping bow. The stones are good, there is no doubt about it, and they have managed to retain their appeal despite being off the home scene concert-wise for many months. The five shows I watched clinched this. But, for my money and sheer professionalism you'll have to look to the very top ranks of show biz to find anything to equal Ike and Tina Turner's review. They are certainly the best thing this country has ever seen. Their spot kicks off with the band in full-blooded blast. A real groovy lineup, trumpet, trombone and saxes, piano organ and drums and a couple of the wildest guitars. Then you get a pair of soul-stepped singers. One of them, Jimmy Thomas, is fantastic. What a knockout voice. Then there are the Aquettes, good solid sex appeal and three of the most swinging chicks in the business. When these girls get going you just don't look anywhere else. Their stage movements push any other dancing you've ever seen way into the shadows. And then there's Tina Turner. Wow, what a woman, tempestuous Tina, who moves like a wild animal and sings in such a wonderful raw way. She hits the stage like a hurricane and you find yourself spellbound by her voice. Their whole pop pageant is electrifying and hypnotic. The Yardbirds, well, I am afraid they're just the Yardbirds. They're a fine group and turn out some sensational songs. They have also become exceedingly colorful lately. Jimmy Page's wardrobe must be fairly bursting with outrageous outfits. But the poor Yardbirds appeared rather stifled by the rest of the stars. And following the Turner team and preceding the Stones wasn't easy. Peter Jay and the Jaywalkers don't really have long enough to get going. They work very hard and do a good job. Lead singer Terry Reid, obviously out of a similar cast as the Small Faces, will do well. After two weeks on the road, the Stones retired to their various homes quite a bit richer and very tired. The highly efficient Southampton police ensured the Stones' swift and safe passage from the theatre precincts while scores of fans began a fruitless dash after the vehicles. When I arrived at the theatre at 5 o'clock, there was a strange lack of security. Nobody to stop me driving past a rope cordon and nobody at the stage door to ask for my credentials. Inside, some girls had infiltrated by climbing up a fire escape and entering via a top floor door which was open. I wondered why nobody bothered to erase the words, Steve, and, plonk, from the stage door. The Yardbirds arrived and went straight to their dressing room. Keith Ralph began reading a feature on the tour in a Sunday newspaper joining Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page in a gale of laughter. Then he found a piece about Brian Jones and his youth, read that out and the trio had another satisfying giggle. Chris Dredger had been silently surveying the scene, so I asked him what he thought of the Yardbirds' new single, Happenings, ten years time ago. He smiled and replied, I'm not saying anything. Jeff Beck said, you'll dig it. 
It's got a load of chat in it. People will say it's the who, but it's not. It's like we left the tape on while the road manager was packing up the equipment. There's comments like, are you a group, and, I'm pulling birds. Resplendent in a black frock coat embellished with Roy Rogers badges and purple bell-bottom trousers, Jimmy Page strolled over and commented, this is a psychedelic guitar strap. It was made by Aztec Indians. Backstage, Peter Jay was watching the Ike and Tina Turner band rehearse. He said, there haven't been any full houses. At Ipswich they just sat there. It's better further north. In a nearby dispensary, Long John Baldry and Radio London disc jockey Mark Roman were relaxing. John was the compare of the show, rather an unenviable job I thought. It wasn't difficult, he said. It was probably because they know me, not as if I was just a person they'd shoved on as a compare. Back at the theatre, the show was underway. Tina Turner was singing off-key and getting more applause for her behind wiggling than her singing. Bad microphones were proving a hazard for the act. The Yardbirds came on and Keith Relf was immediately drowned by Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page, who seemed to be having a competition to see who could play loudest. Finally, it was the Stones and one girl managed to scale the orchestra pit wall and actually clamber halfway onto the stage before being hauled back. Viv Prince, ex-drummer of The Pretty Things, who had been doing a good job of signing autographs was walloped by a policeman who mistook him for a fan. After their act, the Stones toweled off in their dressing room and quickly dealt with cans of beer. Further supplies had to be sent out for. Charlie Watts sat quietly on a settee with his wife and his newly acquired moustache gave him a somewhat sinister appearance. He told me that he considered the Jay Walker's 16-year-old lead singer Terry Reid excellent and well in the Steve Windward class. I asked him how things had been going for him and he mused, you live and you die, even at weekends. Keith Richard was reading the Sunday Times supplement about the killing of President Kennedy. When I commented that the controversy had been going on for a long time, he turned on me and said, don't put things down if you don't know anything about them. If you're interested in the facts, take it and read it. Mick Jagger admitted to being very tired and said, I haven't been going out much lately, just staying indoors. I want to sleep for about a week now. With hectic preparations for the Stones' departure being made, I left to find I had been given a little memento by a fan. So if the young lady who wrote, I love Mick, in lipstick on my car would like to apply to me, I will supply her free of charge with a sponge and a bucket of hot water. Several years after the 1966 tour, Tom Keelock, who was the Stones minder and driver at the time, shared these memories about the tour. October 7, 1966. Colston Hall, Bristol. That was a crazy night. Ike and Tina Turner were on the bill and he accused Tina of giving Mick Jagger the eye. He went berserk backstage and in their dressing room, smashing the place to bits. We were all next door, listening in stunned silence. Then Ike burst in, looking for Jagger. Mick, thank God, wasn't there. We managed to calm Ike down and I took him and got him a drink which was another bad idea because he didn't mix well with booze. After I left him, I went to find Mick and warn him to lay off the flirting with Tina because Ike's a nutter. Well, I found him alright. In fact, I found him and Tina under the stage, going at it good and proper. I actually tripped over them in the dark and Mick turned round saying, Who the fuck's there, who's that? I flew out of there sharpish thinking how fucking lucky he was with me disturbing him instead of Ike. I missed a lot of that tour because I had one of my regular clients over. According to my diary, it was probably Shirley MacLaine. I would always drop anything if at all possible for Shirley, she's a lovely lady. I sent one of my drivers to cover for me, George Caulfield. He was a good bloke but after two days he rings me up and and threatens to quit there and then. He said, I'm leaving. I'd rather do a fucking funeral than do this. I was back for the last show at Southampton and managed to convince George to stay on with the firm by giving him the day off with pay, before driving down to see the boys. The first one I see is Brian leaning at the bar with these group of girls, cigarette in his mouth, cocky little bastard. He said, hey Tom, it's good to see you back, that other bloke was a bit funny, wasn't he? No Brian, he ain't funny, he's bleeding sane. I can't take this all. 